Okay, it's 9 a.m. Good morning, everyone. And uh, I hope reporting season is treating everyone well. Um, we have two interesting companies uh, joining us this morning. And I'm just going to quickly run through some uh, introductory slides for anybody that hasn't been here before. So my name is Mark Tobin. I'm the founder of Coffee Microcaps, and I'd like to welcome everyone to this morning's meeting. Let's quickly run over some housekeeping slides. Yeah, for anyone who hasn't joined us before, I generally run these every fortnight. This is the 21st edition of the Coffee Microcaps morning meeting. Uh, the structure of the webinar is it's 30 minutes for each company, which we kind of break down into a, a 20 minute prezzo and 10 minutes for Q&A. If you have any questions, please type them in the Q&A box rather than the chat function. The Q&A function it just makes it easier for me to, to moderate the questions at the end. Please note that the webinar is being recorded and it will be posted on the Coffee Microcaps YouTube channel um, probably tomorrow morning. Uh, in terms of following Coffee Microcaps, you can follow us on Twitter at C Microcaps. As I said, the YouTube channel for the recording of this webinar and all our previous webinars. LinkedIn, where I do some additional long form content. I also run a weekly paid newsletter, uh, which you can find on the Substack platform. Our first presenter this morning, who we're going to get to in just a second, is Mr. Martin Barrett, MD and CEO of Oswide Bank. Uh, after Mark, we're going to have Mr. Gary Roloff joining us from Auckland in New Zealand, the co-founder and MD of Layboys Group. So without further ado, I'm just going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to hand over to Martin. Martin, do you want to start sharing your screen? Yep. see your uh, hover slide yet no it's technical issue first thing in the morning that's all set up okay Can you see that now? No, and we can't see anything as yet. Okay. Um, Martin, it's Maddie here. I can share my screen if you want. Can you do that, uh, yeah. Maddie? That yeah. would be um, that would be um, great. Can everyone see that? Uh, we can, Maddie. If you can just um, change it to presenter or uh, slideshow mode, sorry. So we get it in. There we go. You're on full screen now. Yeah. Um, Fabulous. Thank you for the rescue, Maddie. Um, and um, good morning, uh, uh, everybody. Um, fantastic to, to be here uh, and to talk to you about uh, Oswide uh, Bank. We've uh, just released our financial half year results for 2021 and following what was a um, outstanding year for us in 2020, despite you know the usual or the uh, the, the impacts of uh, COVID, uh, we were able to improve our underlying profit by circa 16% in 2020. After we took around about 2.3 million dollars of uh, provisions uh, for potential future impacts from COVID. Uh, we're still able to uh, record a net profit uh, after tax increase of, uh, of 8%. So that was last kind of financial year. So I think we were the only listed bank in Australia that actually demonstrated a improvement uh, in terms of uh, profitability. 
Uh, and that will be a little bit of a theme of the uh, conversation we have uh, this morning. Um, our half year result, as I said, was uh, very uh, strong um, and uh, we released that uh, yesterday. That half year result uh, is 23.9% up uh, on the same time last year. That really came off the back of a fairly significant increase in terms of our uh, loan book. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that also uh, in a minute, but a little bit about Oswide Bank. So, um, you know, home uh, effectively in Bundaberg, uh, an organization that's now been around uh, for 50 odd years. Uh, started life as the Burnett Permanent Building Society, uh, became Wide Bay Capricorn, Wide Bay Australia. And uh, back in 2016, we converted from a building society uh, to a bank uh, and uh, changed our name to Oswide Bank. We've been on the stock exchange since about 1995. It's perhaps, though, uh, only in the last um, four to five years that we've really started to hit our straps. I joined the organization uh, about eight years ago and we had a significant amount of work to do to modernize the organization. We had a substantial number of branches uh, and many branches uh, uh, that were in the same uh, regional towns through uh, Queensland. We had poor infrastructure, uh, our technology investment was lagging um, and uh, we had an older base uh, customer. Um, so very much like uh, you would expect perhaps from a building society. Today, this business is uh, completely transformed. Today, we have a thriving broker business. Uh, we have a thriving uh, private bank. Uh, we have um, a substantial diversification of funding. Uh, we have um, a significant uh, improvement in terms of uh, customer numbers and over recent years, uh, new younger customers that are coming to um, Oswide and we've uh, had quite some substantial turnaround in terms of technology spend. That technology spend is not only um, in uh, what our customers utilise, but uh, just as importantly, um, how we're transforming the back office of the organisation. So let me um, then just go on to um, the financial kind of highlights that I just quickly uh, mentioned uh, before. Uh, those uh, financial highlights were in the half year a 13.4% annualised growth in our home loan book. I think that's amongst the fastest home loan growth of any uh, listed bank, in fact, any bank uh, uh, in Australia. We saw a 23.9% increase in our statutory net profit after tax. Again, I think that's the strongest net profit after tax of uh, any listed bank uh, in Australia. Um, our earnings per share uh, increased by 5.1 cents per share to uh, 27. Um, and really important for those that uh, seek dividends, uh, we increased our dividend by two cents uh, per share. There'll be a slide a little later on I'll take you through which uh, shows you uh, a journey over a number of years and you'll see the consistency and improvement of our, uh, our performance. That dividend of 19 cents per share based on share price close yesterday is representing around about uh, a 6% a yield um, if you annualise that dividend. Uh, and that's uh, uh, fully franked. So it's a pretty, uh, pretty strong return. Um, I mentioned before COVID. COVID uh, has um, impacted uh, uh, a lot of businesses and certainly uh, it impacted uh, the banking businesses um, last financial year. Um, for us, that meant that in June 2020, at the, um, at the end of our financial year, we had about $285 million uh, or about 8.9% of our total loan book that was on some form of support package where customers have requested support because of the uncertainties of COVID that either been directly impacted um, or uh, they thought that there was going to be some impact on them. Um, so we were quick to provide assistance to those particular customers. But what's been evident uh, for us um, as uh, uh, COVID uh, has continued and, um, and, and Australia generally has managed COVID very, very well, and Queensland in particular has managed uh, COVID well, 
uh, is that now we are down to less than 1% of our loan book that uh, has that COVID support. So this slide shows 37.2 million, 1.1%, uh, but uh, numbers as of uh, about a week ago um, were showing around about just over 30 million. Uh, under 1%. And as we've talked to our customers, about 115 of those that are still on support, um, it's apparent to us that the vast majority of those come the 31st of March uh, will no longer require um, support. So that number will fall uh, materially uh, again, uh, which is good news. It's great news for customers, uh, but it's also great news uh, for the bank. And again, uh, a few slides on, I'll show you uh, what our provisioning is looking like uh, for uh, for COVID and for uh, other um, uh, potential sort of bad debts. Move across to the next slide, our broken network. Just want to talk to you about one of the areas that so we have been focusing a lot of attention on um, and getting uh, substantial uh, traction, which has assisted us with that uh, loan book growth. We've identified some time ago that the broker channel uh, was a growing channel. And by that, today, uh, more than 55% of all home loans in Australia uh, are written by brokers. There's actually some statistics are saying that's now pushing up uh, you know, to, uh, to 60%. That actually um, is a very, very uh, powerful tool for an organisation like uh, Oswide. If you've got distribution branch networks all over Australia, if you've got uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of your own lenders um, and you've got significant investments uh, there, then uh, perhaps the broker channel um, can be seen just as much as a competitive threat. But for us, it actually represents a huge opportunity. Um, for us, uh, getting that broker channel piece right, that is being efficient in terms of the uh, processing of those loans, reducing the cost per loan um, in that processing, continuing high quality um, loan origination, um, uh, and working hard to ensure brokers and their customers get a great experience is actually a recipe for great success for us. And over the last two years in particular, we've been working very hard to produce what we think is one of the best um, back office um, uh, broker uh, process centres uh, uh, in Australia, where some are taking 15, 20, 30 days uh, to turn around uh, loans. Uh, through that channel, we are taking approximately six. Now, some of you may have heard that you can get loans approved in 24 hours. Well, some of our customers do get loans approved in 24 hours if all that information comes through um, in, in one hit. Uh, but generally, you know, the average tends to be for us more like about six to seven days, which is amongst the best in the industry. I think we, uh, we rank uh, along with Macquarie, who are recognised as being the best in the industry. That's winning us business. The other thing that's uh, assisting us in broadening our broker exposure is uh, the first home loan deposit scheme. So some of you may be aware that the government introduced this scheme um, during the height of the um, COVID issues to support the uh, housing market and particularly to support first home owners. Effectively, the government steps in to provide a guarantee rather than those customers that don't have uh, a 20% deposit, they only may have 10% deposit. Um, the government steps in to provide a guarantee for that difference. So from the bank's perspective, it's a very um, safe lend. It's an 80% LBR kind of lend uh, uh, with a government guarantee supporting that uh, particular loan. We're one of only 26 um, lenders on that panel. Um, one of only a few in the listed space uh, on that panel. The others are Commonwealth Bank, National Australia Bank, I think Bendigo might be on there as well, and my state, uh, and, and ourselves in the listed space. Um, there's a carve out between big banks and the smaller ones, um, and we have been uh, uh, com competing very strongly and uh, performing extremely well uh, in that particular sort of space. It seems that that particular program has uh, a little way to run yet. So uh, that's fantastic. It's allowing us to demonstrate our capability to brokers and we're getting more opportunities off the back of that, which is uh, fabulous. The other area for us, which has um, been 
an area of substantial focus is private bank. Um, private bank uh, effectively is a focus towards kind of high net worth individuals. Um, we uh, brought on board uh, some capability there, some, uh, uh, some individuals who are um, well known, uh, particularly in the uh, Brisbane, Brisbane market, a strong, um, loyal uh, customer base, and they've built uh, a strong um, uh, number of customers that have come across to us. Uh, that channel has been growing exponentially. What we've discovered is a fantastic service uh, that we provide to those people um, uh, is then a, a fabulous marketing exercise for us because it leads to uh, word of mouth. Um, and we are seeing uh, daily uh, several opportunities coming through uh, our doors uh, with some, you know, some fantastic um, you know, opportunities uh, for us to, uh, to help provide a service. People don't need to be stuck in a call center for 20 minutes. People don't need to be talking to people who can't make decisions. Uh, people don't need to be um, getting frustrated about how they might be able to contact someone or what the turnaround times may look like because we prioritize all that. And we provide those, um, uh, those private bank clients with uh, you know, an outstanding service and the feedback we're getting um, there is, uh, is, 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 is really uh, encouraging. So we'll continue to build that uh, business. And as I said, the pipeline for that particular business uh, currently is, uh, is really exciting. Okay, so just going on to the um, track record of our growth, um, you'll see on, the, on, on this slide um, and the next um, that we have been consistently performing strongly. Um, so we have been improving our net profit after tax. We've been improving our net interest revenue. Uh, we've been improving and increasing our loan book. Uh, earnings per share has been going up. Cost to income ratio, importantly, has been coming down. We are now, from a small bank perspective, the most efficient bank in Australia, um, with a cost to income ratio below 60%. If I can put that into some sort of uh, perspective for you, that's a better cost to income ratio than the one that Bendigo uh, recently, um, recently announced. So we do things very efficiently uh, in Oswald, and we um, will continue to make sure that We've got that kind of balance right, that balance of investment into the things that matter and deliver results for us, deliver for our customers, uh, deliver for our brokers, um, uh, but also um, uh, ensuring that we are um, not um, uh, wasting money or uh, spending money on things which uh, ultimately uh, may, uh, may not uh, deliver anything for us. Um, one of the areas of strength for us, which again kind of puts us outside of um, where, where, where banks generally have been, um, is our net interest margin. Our net interest margin uh, improved by six basis points uh, over the half and it's now sitting above uh, two uh, percent. Now that's really critical. Um, it's easy to grow your loan book above system and in our case seven over seven times system. It's easy to grow your loan book by, by splashing your pricing. Um, but if that's not delivering anything to the bottom line, then our view is, well, why do it? It's just choose up capital. Um, it builds a bigger book, sure. Um, but if it's not actually demonstrating any uh, particular value to shareholders, if it's not improving your EPS, if it's not helping us to drive an improved dividend for our um, shareholders, then, then you know, it, 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 it's uh, not, uh, not the most efficient use of our capital. So we try and get that balance right. So over the last uh, number of years, we've also been changing the mix of our deposit book. We've been improving customer deposits now 74, over 74% um, self-funded. We've been reducing some of the wholesale funding um, reliance, particularly securitization, uh, which is more expensive. We've also managed to benefit, uh, obviously, from the interest rates uh, fall sort of occurred. So on a net net basis, yes, that's had an impact in terms of um, the loan book uh, margins, but we've been able to counter that so uh, with a little bit more in the uh, cost of funds, so particularly through the uh, deposits. We expect that's got some way to run um, as a large term deposit book continues to um, turn over. 
I'll flick across if I can quickly to arrears. Uh, I know I'm kind of getting close to time, so I'll, I'll speed through these slides. Um, so Maddie, you can go to the next one. Uh, next one, that's it. You'll see here that despite the fact that we've been growing our loan book um, uh, uh, consistently and strongly, um, our arrears have uh, consistently been falling. We are now, um, uh, I think, uh, amongst the industry leaders uh, in terms of arrears levels of our loan book. So it's a 26 basis points uh, of our book uh, with 30 days past year in terms of arrears. That's a really outstanding uh, position to, uh, to be in and quite so outstanding given the fact that we've been through COVID. On the next slide, we've got our COVID-19 provisions. Back in June 2020, we took a significant increase in terms of provisions on the basis of what you saw in the slide before regarding those, uh, those hardships and the unknown uh, that we were kind of facing. So we increased provisions by $2.3 million. We haven't provided any of those provisions back in this uh, first half. In fact, you'll see that the overall provisions have increased by another sort of $400,000. There is a significant amount there in terms of the COVID overlay, um, and it'll be this half that we review that um, subject to um, the performance of the book over the course of the next kind of half. Um, the board will make some decisions regarding uh, whether that COVID overlay um, is needed in its entirety or uh, is uh, you know, uh, needed uh, at, at all. So we'll see how that uh, uh, translates. But the message here is we are significantly uh, provisioned for uh, any particular challenges. And at a time when we've got record low uh, arrears numbers, uh, you'll, you can see the, um, the fact that there is a, a very um, safe position that, that we're holding. Okay, I'll go on to um, one more slide and then I'll finish uh, dividend and returns. So you'll see here that uh, our story is certainly one of return to shareholders. Whilst we've been able to maintain a very good capital position because profitability has continued to, uh, to improve, um, our interim dividend has also been improving. So we're now at a point where that interim dividend has uh, gone up again by another uh, two cents per share as the board are confident in terms of both our capital position and the performance of the organisation. So that, if you look at the share price close as of yesterday, that's representing a fully franked um, if you annualise that, that's representing a fully frank yield of uh, touching about 6%. So it's, uh, it's, it's pretty strong. Again, I think it's amongst the best in the, um, in the listed space. Uh, earnings per share continues to, uh, to improve um, and uh, hit record, no record uh, number. And our return on net tangible assets has been a goal that we've held to get to 10% for the last 18 months. We'd actually set ourselves a goal of return on net tangible assets of 10% over a three year horizon. We've hit it in 18, uh, 18 months. So that's a kind of fabulous kind of achievement. So we're gonna to have to rethink uh, what our next goal might be there in, turn of, in, in terms of that uh, particular uh, measure. Um, at that point, um, uh, Mark, I'll, uh, I'll finish um, and happy to take uh, any questions. Okay, thanks, Martin. I um, actually got one or two that were emailed in uh, ahead of time. Um, one is, uh, I think we discussed it earlier, opportunities for consolidation or M&A given the BOQ and ME bank tie up. Uh, I guess, uh, are we going to see something happening in across the banking space in terms of... Uh, m and Q or consolidation, what are your views or, or what's the, the thinking from, from Oswide on that? Yeah, sure. Um, so the BOQ ME one uh, is exciting, I think. It's um, the first uh, merger between a listed company and a non-listed or a listed bank and a non-listed bank uh, for several years. In fact, the last one that happened um, that was a listed bank and a non-listed bank was actually us when we uh, merged with a very small uh, credit union called YCU uh, in, uh, in Brisbane. Prior to that, it had been over 10 years since one had happened. Um, I, I, um, I remain a bit cautious in terms of the amount of M&A activity that will happen. What we do see is quite a bit happening between mutuals. 
where no value is really uh, exchanged. Uh, our goal, though, is to continue to try to find those opportunities. And, and for us and our scale, the mutual space is generally the right hit. So we'll continue to try and work with boards of mutuals to see if we can get some, uh, some, some opportunity. Without doubt, um, you know, the environment um, you know, is proving challenging for some. We've been navigating through it really, really well. You know, our organic growth story is kind of fabulous. Um, but, but, you know, uh, a merger uh, does help to give you a little bit of a kick up uh, in terms of some further sort of efficiency gains if, as long as you get that integration and you, uh, you perform well uh, in terms of bringing those two organisations together and critically you don't lose customers on the way. Grand. And the second question I had emailed in ahead of time was on the cost to income ratio. And um, they wanted to know, is, is that as good as it gets? Is it going to settle around this 60 mark? Or wh wh where do you see that going, given it's come down, you know, I think on your slide, it was like 66 I saw at the highest. Yeah. So for us, this is now going to be a revenue story. Um, you know, we, 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 we've got to get the balance right, uh, and we do, I think, have the balance right in terms of continuing to invest in our business. You know, we've got a, uh, a really well-planned technology, continual technology rollout. Uh, we've got some, uh, you know, plans in terms of further improving uh, some of the resourcing around our, um, you know, private bank as that continues to grow and also supporting a uh, broker. Um, we have been really effective within the organization, taking resources from one part of the business not performing so well and placing them in parts where that performance is uh, looking far more compelling. Um, we'll come to the market, I think, uh, you know, between now and our next set of financial year results with our new targets there. But given the fact that we're now under 60, I think it's fair to say that uh, we don't want it going back above 60. Um, and I think we, 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 we would see with the opportunities in front of us, with the pipeline of business that we've got, uh, with the kind of fundamentals that we've got, we would, we would see that we could probably push that further. Okay, great. And uh, that's the two I had ahead of time. I'll just, have we got any questions from the audience before I let Martin go? Because I know he's... Going to be hitting the road uh, up to Bundaberg. And no, okay. Martin, thank you very much for your time. We'll, we'll leave it there. Uh, I can see our next panelist is just jumping on as we speak. Uh, have a safe drive up to Bruce Highway and uh, thank you very much for your time. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mark. Thanks, everybody. Bye bye. Okay. And Gary. We can just uh, good morning, Mark. morning, Gary. How are you? Very well, thank you. Thanks for having me. I can see the cover slide of your presentation now, so we're ready to get straight into it if you are. Yes, I'm ready when you are, Mark. Okay, we'll we'll get going then. Okay, so uh, good morning, everyone uh, from New Zealand. It's where I'm based at the moment. I thought I'd give a little bit of background on lay-by. Uh, the history of our company and what and how we differ from the competitor set that is obviously what you are familiar with in the buy now buy later space. So uh, my name is Gary Roloff. I have a background in um, banking and finance and then went into retail in about uh, late 2000 and then a company called Easy Buy here in New Zealand, which some of you may be familiar with. Then moved into a company called Warehouse Stationery and ran that for three and a half years and ran number one shoes here in New Zealand, New Zealand's largest footwear retailer for a total of seven years. I started this business with my wife and our two sons back and launched in May 2017. We grew very rapidly in New Zealand, leveraging my retail network, as you might expect, and launched in Australia in June of 2018 to support our New Zealand and Australian New Zealand customers who had a presence in Australia or who shipped there. In August of 2018, my wife and I and our younger son, who was then 21, relocated to London to set up an office in London to grow our business in the UK, and we launched up there in October of 2018. 
We were living up there, traveling back to New Zealand, obviously, from time to time for work. Uh, came back here for summer, January 2020. Flight booked to return to the UK in March, on March the 28th. And of course, this thing called COVID came along and that kind of wrecked our plans. So we've been back in New Zealand ever since. We have a team in New Zealand totaling 65 people. We have four people in Australia and 20 people in the UK. So I spend a lot of time on Zoom calls, as you all do nowadays. Uh, particularly at night, uh, night time into our UK office. So I hope that gives you a bit of a sense of who we are. Differentiate in one very obvious way, and that is that we are a weekly payment cycle provider. Our customers pay us the first installment on day one, date of purchase, and then they pay us one sixth of the purchase price each week for the ensuing five weeks. That means we differentiate for the consumer on a website or indeed in store as well, because we are for that weekly cycle after pay offers a fortnightly or clear pay in the UK and Klarna offers a monthly cycle in the UK. So from a retailer's perspective, they're very happy to add us because we provide another point of difference and offer their customers choice. We have a couple of other products that differ from our competitor set. One is called lay by boost that allows our customers to spend more than their lay by limit, providing they pay the excess on the date of purchase. So to put that into an example, you have a hundred dollar lay by limit. You want to buy something for $187. You pay us $87 today and then $20 a week for the subsequent five weeks. The good news out of that for lay by is that we get our commission on the full $187. So the ROI is very big. The other differentiator is that we're the only buy now pay later platform that is currency agnostic. So when I was first up in the UK, I could say to retailers, do you ship to New Zealand or Australia? They said, yes, but our challenge is we don't have a New Zealand or Australian website. And we don't have a New Zealand or Australian bank account we were able to say, well, that's fine. We can introduce you to our customers because we'll pay you in pounds and receive New Zealand or Australian dollars from, um, from the consumer. So we're currency agnostic, which means as we scale, our consumer database becomes very valuable to retailers that ship into the countries that those consumers come from. So look, I hope that gives you a bit of a sense of who we are. The weekly payment cycle just happens to be the most capital efficient payment cycle in the buy now pay later market. We turn our capital 24 times a year, which we believe wide out of funding lines that we have in place, which I'll talk to shortly. So I'm going to quickly whiz you through our Q3 results presentation that I have in front of you. I'll take some questions at the back end. So I'm going to whiz through this pretty fast. It is available on our investor site for you to look at at some detail, but there are some things I'd really like to highlight for you. So bear with me, please. Mark, if you could just confirm that you're seeing the next slide come up, which is performance highlights. Uh, yeah, I can see it, Gary, all good. Great, thank you. So as at the end of Q3, our financial year finishes 31 March, so 31st of December, we had a, uh, our revenue was up nine and a half, up 157% on the prior period. Our active merchants totaled eight, just over 8,000 and our active consumers closing in on 700,000. I will update you at the back end of this slide as to where we are as at uh, January. We have uh, off the back of that December quarter, our GMV annualizes at 730 million New Zealand dollars and our um, contribution out of the UK is 401 million of that annualized 730. So that is a massive uplift on PCP uh, to the tune actually on December quarter 2019, GMV for the UK was 55 million Kiwi. Wine for 12 months, it's 401 million. So very pleased with the growth we're seeing out of that key growth engine. Our defaults have reduced down to 2.8 from a 4.6 uh, prior period. And as I'll talk to you shortly, we launched a tap to pay in-store service through a collaboration with MasterCard. We are beta testing in the US or are as at now. Our key operating metrics really speak for themselves. You can see the growth in GMV, uh, annualized GMV, active merchants and active customers. All those graphs are doing what we need them to do, um, upwards and pointing to the right. So 
very proud to see the sort of growth we're seeing in active customers uh, quarter on quarter and obviously active merchants similarly. And we'll drill down now into the key growth driver, which is the UK. And this is what I was talking about before. You can see for Q3 2020, 55 million in annualized GMV growing to 401, active customers growing from 76,000 to 407,000, and active merchants growing from 240 to 1,264. So we've worked really hard over this period to grow our business from a breadth perspective. We landed these headline highlight brands, lighthouse brands, whatever you want to call them. Uh, and we are now building out our merchant base with that SME market, which gives us a greater uplift on our commission percentage. From the Australian and New Zealand perspective, we are still growing very rapidly in New Zealand. Australia is not a strategic imperative for us. We see Australia as a support market for our New Zealand retailers, but more and more we are gaining traction in Australia through some large retail relationships we have there, not least of which you'll see down here is cotton on. The New Zealand market continues to grow very well for us and to give you a sense of that growth, December 2020 was 65% up on December 2019. We will continue to invest in these markets as appropriate, but our investment in time, money and resource is better applied to those growth engine, the growth engine in the UK than it is in the highly competitive market that Australia now is. Our repeat customers and purchase frequency continues to improve. This is important for us because the greater the percentage here in repeat customers, the uh, lower your default rate because repeat customers are self-regulating, obviously. And we're seeing that growth in the UK, which is encouraging because it demonstrates how consumers in that market are adopting the buy now, pay later premise. I'll spend a very short amount of time on our financial metrics. This is usually where our CFO would be presenting to you. We've, um, we've had a significant fall in gross losses, as you can see, and um, a slight uptick here as a result of us opening the floodgates more in the UK. A better representation of this is in the following uh, two slides on. What I wanted to point you to was our annualized revenue. Annualized revenue off the quarter, December 2020 is just under 40 million, up from 14 million just 12 months prior. So you can see the rapid growth in revenue and rapid growth in GMV quarter on quarter. Our income is growing as well, largely now and now dominated by the UK. And you can see how the mixture of late fees to merchant income is growing from a perspective of merchant income overpowering late fees. Late fees is lower in New Zealand because of the larger percentage of repeat customers. It will do the same in the UK as we scale and get that larger percentage of repeat customers showing through. Uh, this slide here is one that has been of particular interest to investors since we listed. You'll note back here that when we were listing back in Q3 of FY20, we had had a quarter of negative NTM. That was a result of us being hammered by fraud when we first went into the UK with some large merchants. We demonstrated very quickly to the market how we could overcome that by closing down the customers that we were prepared to accept through the funnel and demonstrated we had control of that. We have opened that funnel up intentionally going into that peak trading period of Christmas. And that's why you see that volatility in NTM. When you look at NTM on a 12 months rolling, you can see the improvements that we are knocking down here as we scale and grow in that key UK market. The UK actually uh, has a reduced transaction cost, a lower transaction cost than we have in New Zealand particularly, because New Zealand's merchant service fees are not regulated. They are in the UK. And to give you a sense of the difference, our merchant service fee cost in New Zealand's 1.65%. 
at same cost in the UK is 55 basis points. So a significantly different cost base out of the UK. These are some of the big merchants and partner signups that we've had in the UK since launch. You'll see some very familiar household names uh, appearing here. WH Smith, JD Sports, the Hunt Group you may not be as familiar with. They turn over in excess of a billion pounds. They have a number of beauty products and others that are on our site. Boohoo, you're probably familiar with. I'll talk to you about the sports clubs, uh, Arsenal, uh, Man City and Man U shortly. Uh, Cotton On, we have a deal with Cotton On where they have uh, options on equity in Laybuy and that is triggered around their ability to drive GMV growth for Laybuy. We have a similar deal with Boohoo for the UK market. Wilco, we added just before Christmas last year. Wilco is a general purpose homeware retailer, turns over in excess of one and a half billion pounds. Within three weeks of being on our platform, they were either number two or three in terms of GMV contribution every day. We've done a deal with the English Premier Football Clubs. We provide Buy Now Pay Later service to Arsenal FC uh, online, and we do offer it in the stadium, but of course the stadium's uh, shut at the moment due to COVID. We have signed exclusive Buy Now Pay Later partners, uh, sponsorship deals with Manchester United and Manchester City FC. Uh, that gives us access to their fan base around the world. And of course, with COVID, we haven't been able to trigger that in store, but we are very shortly rolling out our collaboration with their website provider for merchandise. And we will be accessing the fan base of these clubs, which in the UK alone for Manchester United and Manchester City totals about 16 million fans. Funding for growth, we have two facilities in place. We have a Kiwi Bank facility here that funds our New Zealand and Australian book. And we have an 80 million pound facility out of Victory Park capital of Chicago that funds our UK book. We are working with Victory Park at the moment to slightly alter that facility so that it includes drawdown capability for the US as well. This is quite an, uh, an important innovation for Laybuy. We were one of the first fintechs in the world to become a card issuer and have our own unique bin number, as it is called. We now issue a Laybuy debit card, a digital debit card that is part of our app. What that means is a consumer can tap to pay with Laybuy through their digital wallet uh, anywhere that Laybuy is offered in store. We will also roll this out in a ubiquitous fashion for single time payment. Ultimately, the goal is, of course, to roll that out and pay it in six anywhere. The, um, the commercials on that pay it in six anywhere are being worked through right now in order to ensure that that is a profitable transaction for Laybuy. So we don't need any integration with the retailer to offer this to them. We ride the MasterCard rails in store. So it is simply a tap to pay through that MasterCard FPOS terminal, if you like, the hardware. The retailer doesn't do anything other than give us their merchant ID number that we can then enable to allow them to offer this service. So a huge step forward for us means we don't have to worry about integrations with point of sale systems that we have done when we first launched our company and gives us access to retailers anywhere that market MasterCard is accepted. Our growth strategy is pretty straightforward. We aim to increase our market share in our already established geographies. We have a very dominant position, or, or we are one of the two dominant players here in New Zealand, unquestionably, alongside Afterpay, and we wax and wane as to who has the advantage on any given day. In Australia, we are recognised as a credible third player in that market, but it is fair to say a distant third from Afterpay and Zip. We are, as I have said earlier, we do not seek to spend a lot of time and money in that very competitive Australian market, but we will certainly preserve our market share in any established market that we're in and look to increase it. We're looking to rapidly grow in the UK. That is our growth engine. Uh, we are seeing that growth quarter on quarter, month on month, quarter on quarter. 
We want to target the SME merchants through a partnership program that we have put in place, and that diversifies us away from being beholden to any one large retailer. I think when you come from New Zealand or Australia, you know, you're not used to retailers who turn over in, a, in excess of 5.5 billion pounds annum. They are, they are seriously big retailers. And we launched our beta tests prior to Christmas in the US. I see the US as a marvelous opportunity for us to offer lay-by to our transatlantic and Australasian customers who have a presence there. We will look to put the pedal down in the US over the course of calendar 21. But our focus from a management perspective, the day-to-day -day management perspective is in that growth engine in the UK. I'm working with our CFO to ensure the strategic markets like the US and others we are contemplating have adequate foundations laid so that we can really go after them. From a new platform perspective, this is all about improving the operational efficiency of our platform for our consumers and our retailers, making it easier for them to use and a better experience in terms of information we can provide for them. We want to increase our engagement and repeat purchasing through our app, and our app is very well registered in terms of how it, it behaves and how it is liked by our customers. And obviously this MasterCard collaboration is a huge win for us. And um, when the stores start to open in the UK, we will be rolling that out in the UK uh, at pace. We've got this running in New Zealand and Australia today. We intentionally pause that in the UK because of COVID um, and, and the obvious closing of stores that has gone with that. Just to give you a little bit of a, a sense of how our momentum continued into our subsequent to Christmas, we added over a uh, almost almost 120,000 customers uh, since December, and over 1,600 active merchants. We had our record GMBs for November and December, um, representing a 183% uplift on PCP. As I mentioned in November, we launched with Wilco and our digital product has been launched and we have seen the US lockdown had a significant surge in uh, GMV pre-Christmas. Um, like all retail around the world, Chris, uh, retail trading in January and February is later than November and December, but our business continues to knock down prior year growth um, in significant percentage increase. I just thought you might be interested in what we achieved on Black Friday. Uh, the numbers speak for themselves, um, huge uplifts on the prior year, which indicates how we are signing up more consumers and more merchants. From an outlook perspective, we've um, continued to add merchants in January. We've added 230 merchants and another 23,000 active customers. We are expecting to drive our improved year-on-year -year GMV growth in Q4, and, and that is continuing. Uh, just had a review on that uh, prior to coming on this call. We've continued to invest in people uh, and, and the partnership program that I spoke of, which is around partnering with agencies that have broad, small, medium enterprise clients and working with them to enable lay-by for their clients. Um, and obviously, we are monitoring the impact of COVID in the UK. Um, it is fair to say that everybody is concerned about the economic impact of COVID when the furlough schemes roll out in April. We have confidence in the way we can handle credit risk and have demonstrated that by our ability to turn the tap on and off in terms of the customer inflow that we allow to sign up to lay by through our integrations with Experian globally, which is the world's first or second biggest uh, credit bureau. And we have a partnership with one of their strategic partners, Centrix here in New Zealand. So look, that's me, um, that's lay by. I'm more than happy to answer any questions that you may have and, and hope you found that informative. Uh, thanks, Gary. We've got a, a few that are emailed in ahead of time for somebody who couldn't join us with uh, just a busy morning it is. Can I just ask you, Gary, just kind of a glimpse of it there at the end to just go to the final slide that has, I think, your contact details uh, on the end, just if anybody wants to make a note of them. 
I think it was different. Yeah, sure. Uh, I'll just put investors at labor.com. Yeah, the there, there we go. Okay, perfect. Um, so one of the questions was uh, around Brexit now that it's actually real since the, the, the 1st of January. Um, what impacts have you seen from that? And, you know, are you looking at setting up a, a dedicated EU presence outside of the, of the UK? No, Brexit doesn't, doesn't affect us at all. So, um, we, we have growth aspirations into Europe, but at the moment, the runway ahead of us in the UK is long and we need to make sure we're focused on that. And I think you alluded to it in your uh, presentation, but maybe you can give it a little bit more context now on, on the US uh, launch. Is, is the thinking to go with existing retailers who have um, sales or a decent footprint in the US as the as the strategy or is it a combination of those plus um you know a, a big bang approach and just go hard and try and sign up retailers that you don't have a relationship with yeah the first the first step will be um working with our existing merchants who have a presence in the us uh, because we have some huge merchants that do JD Sports is very big in the US. They've also made some recent acquisitions over there. And we're working with them right now to enable that in the US. Boohoo similarly. And we have um, other retailers in the pipeline that I can't talk about right now because it's not publicly available information. But we have some significant uh, opportunity in the US through the relationships we have in the UK. Uh, if you may... You may be interested to know that outside of the UK, the US is the biggest market. Outside of the UK and China, the US is the biggest market for Manchester United fans. Okay. And then final question, then just on managing the currency risk, um, you know, with the UK getting bigger and bigger and the, and the translation back into New, into New Zealand dollars. Uh, do you guys do hedging or which way do you work it? Yeah, look, we've got a natural hedge anyway because we're drawing down in, in pounds and we're getting and we're receiving pounds. We obviously have a currency fluctuation risk on the financial reporting when you consolidate into New Zealand dollars, but there's some pretty clear accounting rules on how we have to do that. Okay. Now, a question coming in now. Um, weekly versus fortnightly versus monthly. Yeah, um, could any of the competitors match you on the weekly or is their whole kind of system back end built on these various different payment cycles that they offer oh look i think um, it would be fair to say any one of us could offer you know we could offer fortnightly or monthly if we wanted to and i'm sure afterpay could offer weekly and monthly if they wanted to but the reality is and i true firmly believe the success of afterpay which has been phenomenal is a uh, is as much a function of the simplicity of their message to the consumer as it is to the quality of the people that they have in their business. I mean, pay it in four is their brand equity. And that is the simplicity of the, of the product that has driven their growth. We are pay it in six, and there is no need for us to muddy the waters in that brand message by trying to be cute. I think in time, there will be a choice offered by the brands, but your brand equity is, in our case, pay it in six, and Afterpay is pay it in four, and Klan is pay it in three. Um, and I think uh, for the near future anyway, and I'm talking 18 to 24 months, I mean, this industry moves pretty quickly. The brand equity is all in that messaging to the consumer, making it simple. Okay, great. Okay, let me just see if we got any further questions coming through from the audience. Doesn't look like it at this stage. Um, Gary, I think we'll we'll leave it there because I know it's been a very busy morning with a lot of uh, results dropping and the market is about to open in three or four minutes. Um, thank yep. you very much for the time. Just to remind everybody that um, Gary's presentation and Martin's presentation, which we had just before, uh, will be going up on the YouTube channel to tomorrow morning for anybody who uh, wants to watch it back or may have missed the slide or, or we ran over something a, a little too quickly. And with that, I'll leave it there. Gary, thank you very much for your time once again. Pleasure, Mark. And thank you for having me uh, present today. I really appreciate it. Goodbye, everybody. Have a good day. Cheers. Thanks, Gary.